this podcast is brought to you by Aldis International, supplying your expert AI and digital transformation staffing needs across the U.S. and Europe. Today, you are listening to our AI in Action series, where leading minds in AI from across the world share their story, success, and advice. AI in Action cuts through the hype and explores the true impact of artificial intelligence in our world today. listening to AI in Action. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Akrisht Gupta. Akrisht is the VP of Engineering at LenBuzz. Akrisht, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, JP. Oh, it's our pleasure. So let's start with a background on yourself. Can you give us a brief overview of, of your journey in, in tech, specifically where you first got started, some of the roles you've held along the way, and take us up to today as, as you lead the engineering practice for Lenbus? My journey really started when I joined my bachelor's in uh, India at the school called IIT. It's actually a famous school and they have really built a reputation for themselves across the world. The IITians, the alumni, they have been great. They have been great leaders in their own fields. For me, I think just joining the computer science program, it, that's what it kicked off the, the whole process. It has also been about the approach. So how do you go about uh, approaching real world, like real life problems? And how does science play like a role in that? And I think it began there right out of the college i got i took my first job i was working as an infrastructure engineer at a high frequency trading firm you, you get to apply all of these concepts that you learn in college but you get to see real results you get to see tangible impact when people are using your services or network code networking code or other software code that you have been writing and so it was much more about application the college i, I got to learn about application and at that point, I applied for master's here at multiple schools. I, I was fortunate to get into MIT. So, of course, I decided to take it. I, take, I took the opportunity. And at MIT, it was more about research and just starting to build an understanding of how research is done and how like fields grow. So research is all about increasing the size of the, the field is like a huge body of work. How do you add to it? How do you increase the knowledge of humanity? So it was very interesting, completely different from how regular sort of education works in which you are reading something that someone wrote, someone worked on it already and someone proved it and you just have to not necessarily memorize it, but you have to just understand it. You just relearn it. But with research, you are coming up with new knowledge, some, sometimes foundational, like sometimes it's very important. So. That was pretty interesting. And then I was also lucky to work on some very interesting problems. So the first problem that we were working on in MIT, it was called looking around the corners. And the idea is very interesting. It's let's say you're in a corridor and you have a camera looking at the corridor. And sure, the camera can observe everyone in that corridor. But let's say the corridor has an intersecting corridor. It's like an L. So there's a big blind spot on the other end, like once you turn, the camera cannot see it. It's not in direct line of sight. And the question we had was, you know, technically the camera camera cannot see it directly. It's not in direct line of sight, but technically the light from people or objects which are hidden is re reaching the camera. It's just taking a few reflections to get there. So for example, if you had a mirror there, then it would be a simple problem. You could just be like, well, you know what, there's a mirror that mirror can show us what's inside the what's hidden on the corner. So let's say you don't have a mirror, you have a wall. The light is still being reflected, it's just being scrambled. Uh, so the question that we were investigating was, can it be done? And it was something, it was one of those things that it started there and it has happened again and again in my career that it seemed like something that should not be possible or cannot be done. And then we did it. Like we showed, first we showed that the information is there. And then we showed how to unscramble this information. So we built like a model and we optimized in an optimization algorithms on it. And we showed it in multiple ways. We wrote like multiple papers around it and it became like a mini field almost. So there was a DARPA grant around it for several million dollars. A lot of institutes are now working on this problem. 
and I think one of the papers in one of the conferences that I remember, it became like a, a mention, like an honor, but it got a prize. So very interesting because it challenges, it's not just about growing the knowledge, but it's also challenging the existing notions. And then in my master's, I was like, this is very great. This is very theoretical. I don't know how much of this is applicable in real world. So I applied, yeah, <laughs> looking around the corner, sounds pretty good. How are we going to apply to real world? So I applied for Bay Area, like I applied for jobs in Bay Area because of Silicon Valley and all of that. I was young. <laughs> I do I do think that people, it's, it's a great experience to work in Silicon Valley. So I got a uh, job opportunity there. I started working there first at LinkedIn and then I, then I switched to Google. And I think over there, it was about becoming more independent. So becoming more independent and coming up with solutions on your own. So it, it was about just learning to be more self-reliant in a way and also leading the projects on my own. So that, that was pretty cool. I also got to work on some very cool projects and Google, one of the projects I worked on was voice action. So let's say you take, a, take your phone and you say, okay, Google, take a picture. That was one of the actions that I built, I worked on. And then while I was working, I, I, I guess it was just this thing that I was like, you know what? I can see the application of all of this knowledge that I had learned at MIT. So I applied, I decided to go back and start working on my PhD. And I think my PhD was really where I sort of learned the approach, the, the fundamental way of how I currently examine everything. And I, I applied to almost day to day, not just to my, my career, but like my personal life. And, and I think the approach was that you want to question things and you want to be like experimental and playful and almost increase your own knowledge and knowledge of the society. So uh, mm-hmm. it's about, it's not about just taking things for granted or just taking things just because someone says they are. Uh, what is, the, what is the, the scientific backing? What is the rational backing for doing something? And at the same time, I think uh, it had this 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 thing, this twist about, OK, some things which look impossible, feel impossible, might actually be possible. So here was something that we built, which will also be sound like, uh, I don't know how much these people are familiar. Now it's become a mainstream almost. But we were I was building, I was engineering these machine learning pipelines in which we had neural networks with several layers and we were trying to connect these layers to process all this data and engineer these neural networks to do better and better. And I spent like an year and a half trying to improve one neural network pipeline. And that became, I wrote two or three papers out of that. And while I was doing that, it struck me that AI, because that's what the, the goal is uh, for artificial intelligence researcher, for data scientists, for machine learning people. The one goal that, the big goal is that, how do we mach- make machines human? And it, it has multiple facets to it. But the facet that we're talking about here is that, okay, if an in, if a human can engineer anything, the machine should be able to engineer it too. And there are, of course, smaller day-to-day tasks of automation, but then the idea was, if I can engineer this machine learning pipeline, technically artificial intelligence agent could engineer this machine learning pipeline. So we had this interesting idea that what if artificial intelligent agents could engineer machine learning pipelines? So it was quite interesting, it was surprising, but I think what it ultimately taught me was to have some self-belief that when you're trying to approach an idea, when you're trying to try something, it's okay that people think that it's not gonna work and maybe it's not gonna work out. You having that self-confidence is really good. And then that's where I actually met the co-founders for the current company, Lendbus, that I work for. One of the co-founders was actually my mentor. He helped me get through my PhD. He was one of the people on my thesis advisory committee. His name is Dan Rabib. When I heard from Dan about this uh, great company, Lendbus, that they've been working on, I was like really excited. And right out of PhD, I decided to join Lendbus. So I've been working at Lendbus for the last three years. It has been great. You are listening to The Oldest Podcast. When you're looking to scale your team, or if you are interested in showcasing your company in a future episode, reach out today. Or if you're in the market for a new role, visit our website to view open positions, www.aldis.com. Talking about where you're at now, let's start with Lenbuzz. Who are Lenbuzz as a business? And then what is it like to be part of the data team there? Lenbuzz was started by Amitai and Dan about 
seven years ago, and they are focused on providing loans for underserved parts of population. So what do I mean by that? When you're applying for any kind of loan, especially car loan or house loan or even credit card, you are required to have a few things. You need to have uh, a credit score or you need to have a social security number. So you need to have a social security number to generate the credit score so that, you know, they can track you and they can keep uh, they can have an idea about your general credit history. But what happens is that immigrants, when they come to America, they don't have a credit history, they don't have a credit score. And it takes time to build the credit history. It takes time to build the credit score. So both founders actually went through this problem of they were trying to buy cars or they were trying to get loans and they were almost like denied or they had issues. And they decided that this is something that should be changed. There should be transformation here because there are clearly other things that we can look about the profile that can help us figure out. That's where the idea or the why of Lendbus was born that, okay, we want to be, we want to provide these loans to other uh, parts of the population, which might be actually very good in uh, very credit worthy, very much credit worthy, but they just don't have the credit score because they were never in the system or they have very thin files as in they have, they don't have depth in their credit histories, but they might still be very good. And they decided to focus specifically on car loans as, as their main application area. My job, my role in LendBuzz has been around the data science till now. So I have been, I have been currently serving as a VP of machine learning and data science. And out of the right out of when I joined LendBuzz, the first thing I started working on was, of course, the machine learning infrastructure for automating the lending process and, and figuring out the risk associated with the borrower. And then while I was doing that, one of the things that sort of uh, struck me was this is going to get, it's going to be hard to scale when you're trying this machine learning models. We have, we had already tried like one or two machine learning models. Each was an improvement over the previous one, but we wanted to go more, like we wanted to have more machine learning models from different aspects of the product. And we wanted to try machine learning models for different data sets and all of that stuff. So the, the thing the sort of, and this is 2018, it's three years ago, what sort of the idea that originated from that was we need to have a system for tracking, training, deploying, creating your reports for, and all of the other things related to machine learning. So we needed to have, now it's called MLOps, but MLOps was like a new thing four or five years ago. And this is three years ago with MLOps starting to pick up. So what we did was, and this uh, was not something that was required or demanded of me, but we ended up building ML Ops framework in-house completely from scratch. And it has some amazing features, which has helped us deploy around 40 or so models. And we have had several generations for many of those models. We have now currently 40 models, five or six microservices. Actually, it's more like 10 microservices now. And each of these models have been trained for a particular aspect of the data set, a particular aspect of the product. And, and we're able to manage it. We're able to deploy it, change the engineering around that and, and retrain. We have, we have a way to go back, replay a model from two years ago with very little effort. So all of that was, while it was not something that was needed, once we built it, it made the scaling and deployment of models very easy. And it led to quite rapid growth of models. So we were only at one or two models in the first year, but the second year we were at like, 13 or 14, and right now we are at like 40 models and we have deployed like 10 microservices. Wow, that. that's huge growth. And yeah. and obviously with that growth, there's, there's a lot of hard work uh, on, on both sides from the data science team, the data engineering team, which I know from our previous conversations, you're heavily involved in both sides. I wanna get your take on what the journey has been like over, over the past few years from when you joined, which is a little over three years ago now, to where you guys are today. How many heads when you were first there? How big is the team now? And, and what has it been like sustainably growing while building the, all these models? So machine learning team, when I joined, it was just me. And of course, the CTO, we had like maybe six people in engineering team. And, and I was one of those six uh, leading the machine learning. And for about a year and a half, that was pretty much it, that I spent a lot of time engineering these different things, building these different things. However, it was very good about, I was very good about defining the boundary. So once the machine learning product was ready, pretty much 
it was usable by the engineering team and we provided an API that they could just directly call and consume. So we didn't have to, I didn't have to spend that much time trying to figure out how to integrate into engineering and rather just provide that API that engineering team could plug and play. Then after one and a half years, we started by hiring some interns and some Europe's over here, they're called co-ops. In, in MIT, they're called Europe's. So yeah, so we we had the first co-op and we actually offered them full-time position. And then from there on, we just we just started growing really rapidly. Uh, so over last year, we had six people and we we have currently four people in the machine learning team. Amazing growth. And Lenbus has also grown like that. Lenbus, when I started three years ago, when I started, they were like maybe 25, 20, 25 people. And currently we have around 100 plus, yeah. That's huge growth in such a short space of time. Um, oh, Chris, you and I have spoken several times in the past, and you've emphasized that the mission at Lenbuzz is something that really helps get the team engaged because there's clarity around not just what you're doing, not how you're doing it, but the why behind it. Can you give us some insight into to what that means to you and how it's helped you build a successful data team over the past few years? Like you said, the why, why Lenbus has been successful, I think is because we know we have been very good about the core value and the core reason, which is the, the why of the organization or the mission statement of the organization, which is to provide loans in these situations when people may not be able to get loans. They may not, they may be underserved part of the population. And I think there's this concept of golden circle that I was reading about the other day, in which there's the center, which is why, and then there's the uh, how and the what. And the key thing there is that you need to have them in order for the organization to understand what they're doing and how they're doing it. If you don't have the why, then a lot of times the message can get lost. So we have been very good about that. You know, we have been very good about this and this resonates throughout our, like all of our teams that you understand the importance of what we do and what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve. Specifically, I would say that on the tech side and the machine learning side, this this information has empowered us to try to build the best models that we can build because we know that this is model which is going to go and help um, someone get a loan faster at, at, so that they can get the process started faster and they can get the contracts and they can get the car and they can drive off faster with it. And the, it has, I think it has also helped when you're doing something, sure, you like doing tech and you like doing the you like building these models and you enjoy uh, learning, but it's also the fact that this is all going to help someone get get a loan, which might be good for them, which they may not have gotten otherwise, which makes you feel good when you wake up every day in the morning. So hope that answers the question. Yeah. And as somebody who's who's been through that struggle when I first moved to the US myself and the importance of building up a credit history, uh, products like Lembos will really help people get settled and, and and do all of the things that's required to embed yourself here in the US. So Akrish, looking ahead now, you and I have spoken about the, the exciting work that you guys have been doing, but more importantly, the, the growth in store. Can you give us some insight into what the rest of the year is going to look like for you, your team and, and into 2022? Yeah, I think one of the things that I, I'll probably be doing, so I was told that I'll actually be transitioning to the much broader VP of engineering role, where I'll be responsible for not just the AI side, but also the other aspects of engineering, including the back end and the front ends, which we use for the website. So uh, I think for me, it'll be a growth opportunity in the sense that I'll get to a lot of other aspects of the technology while doing that. And for Lenbus, I think we are definitely we're looking to hire a lot of people. We are looking to hire talents in all categories of engineering. So we're looking to hire that talent for in engineering, for full stack engineering, for people who are good at machine learning, for QA, maybe DevOps also. That's something that we have to talk about. But there are all of these different verticals that we are looking to hire right now. And I'll probably also be at least partially responsible for uh, a lot of these hirings. <laughs> so obviously, oh Chris, you've you've got your hands full with the year in store, but you've spoken so eloquently about not just what you do and how you do it, but the why behind it all. And that really speaks to why Lenbus is a great place to work for data scientists and data engineers. Thank you so much for coming on today, talking to us about your own career, giving us the insight into Lenbus, and we wish you guys all the best in the work ahead. Thank you, JP, for having us. Thank you. 
thanks for listening to this episode of the oldest podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, rate and review. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any Android podcast of choice. You can also head over to our website, www.aldis.com, to listen to more podcasts, view our open roles, and stay up to date with industry news. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more great episodes coming very soon.